It's been described as a systematic ethnic cleansing. In the kingdom of Bhutan, known as the La Shangri-La, one-sixth of the population were driven out of their homes and their country. Overnight, Bhutanese of Nepali origin became stateless. It's better to be a dog with an identity than a person without one. More than 100,000 people took shelter in refugee camps in Nepal to live a life in exile. We stayed in huts made of jungle reeds. It was scorching hot. So many people died of dysentery. We had to handle up to 32 bodies in one day. Now, after decades of failed negotiations with Bhutan, the camps are empty as the refugees start new lives in other countries. In the first of two special programs, I visit the Beldangi refugee camp in eastern Nepal to listen to their stories. I'm Sabina Shresha. On this edition of 101 East, we meet Bhutan's forgotten people who can only dream of returning home. By a riverbed in eastern Nepal, a family gathers with friends to share a meal for the last time. This is our last get-together. We might not be able to share a meal like this in the future. I wanted everyone to come together and share a meal, good or bad. Share songs of our joys and sorrows. Songs are the resting places for tired souls. When your heart is heavy with sorrow, for us of Nepali origin, these songs really are where we rest and restore them. Sabitra Biswa was 27 when she was forced to flee Bhutan. Since then, she spent the last 23 years in a refugee camp in Nepal. Now, she's about to embark on another life-changing journey. She and her family are preparing to settle in the United States. I had a mother, a father, and a grandfather here in Nepal. I'm leaving them all. This is the very place where I held their last rites. You always remembered who gave birth to you. You remember your homeland. Your homeland is the most important thing. I will remember my homeland and my friends. But memories don't make life. You have to do what you have to do. You have to fulfill your destiny. Sabitra is a Lutsampa, a southern Bhutanese of Nepalese origin. She and her family, her son Amal, daughter Radhika, daughter-in-law Durga and granddaughter Aisha, are stateless. In the late 1980s, the Himalayan Kingdom saw the Lutsampas as a threat to the ruling order. The monarchy introduced a campaign of one nation, one people, enforcing the culture and religion of the majority Drukpa community. Bhutan was growing increasingly alarmed at the political activism of ethnic Nepalese in regions bordering their country. Scholars like Joseph Stradler say Bhutan's rulers were convinced that its own ethnic Nepalese could revolt. There was a lot of fear because of these Nepali populations who were political, and then suddenly you have your own Nepali population becoming political, and I think they overreacted due to the fear of you know, what could occur. Bhutan changed its citizenship laws, requiring proof of land ownership in the government files, and for children to be Bhutanese, both parents had to be registered citizens. Then, in 1988, Bhutan held its first census. Many Lutsampas were suddenly branded illegal immigrants. Royal Government of Bhutan Citizenship Identity Card. The holder of this card is a Bhutanese citizen. 
Before, yes. But people can't enter Bhutan without citizenship papers nowadays. But these papers are not valid anymore. If you try to enter with these papers, well, this citizenship doesn't work anymore. In Bhutan in the late 80s, the human rights situation for the Lhotsampas was growing worse day by day. Protests calling for greater democracy and respect for Nepali rights led to a campaign of violence by the government. And tens of thousands of Lhotsampas fled. But not all were forced out. Dr. Bamparai was the first qualified surgeon in Bhutan. Among his patients was the royal family. He could have stayed. People are attracted to the ideas of royalty. But I thought more of the nation and of the people than the royalty. I wasn't evicted by the king or the government. But when I saw so many people of my country being forced to leave, I chose to leave with them in solidarity. I was a very big problem for Bhutan, for the police there. I didn't wear the baku. They had to find others who didn't wear the baku, but they couldn't find me. So if they were on patrol and they came across me, they had a big problem. They would complain to the seniors, but never told me directly. Today, far from the kingdom's palaces, Dr. Rai gives free medical treatment to refugees. The government of Bhutan calls us illegal immigrants. But Bhutan is a country of only migrants. Dr. Rai says many Lhotsampa's families were living in Bhutan centuries before the current royal dynasty came to power in 1907. To call us who have lived there for so many centuries illegal immigrants, it's a wrong political allegation. And the world does not understand this. Even the Nepalese have the impression that we actually immigrated there illegally and very recently. The government of Bhutan sells off the country and calls us anti-national. The government forces us to leave at the point of a gun and operates state terrorism and calls us terrorists. And yet, the world believes that. Leaving everything behind, the Lhotsampas crossed the border into India, but they were not welcome. The Indian government picked them up in buses and trucks and transported them to the border with Nepal. India did not want to risk offending Bhutan, which provides them with hydropower for large tracts of the country. The move angered Nepal. India permitted uh, Bhutanese refugees to come to Nepal, but they did not permit them to go back to uh, Bhutan. India should facilitate and help the Bhutanese refugee to be repatriated. They came through that land and they have to go back through that land. As the refugees flooded into Nepal, the UN's refugee agency stepped in. Seven camps were set up in Chapa, eastern Nepal. Food, water, health and education were all provided. It was a massive and costly operation, and one that has lasted for decades. When resettlement in new countries was offered in 2007, it was a welcome relief for most. But 50,000 refugees were still determined to return to Bhutan and made a last desperate attempt. Indian security forces stopped them on the bridge between Nepal and India. Two people were killed in the violence that followed. For Sabitrano family, Bhutan is now just a distant memory. When we first came here, we dreamt of nothing but Bhutan. We kept clinging on to that hope that we'd return for a while. 
But it's been 23 years already. Not one person who has waited has been able to go back. If my country doesn't accept me at all, and I can't return home, then what's the use of calling it my country? <laughs> the Bhutanese Prime Minister's office denied our request for an interview. So, to find out more, we went to the India-Bhutan border. Southern Bhutan is off-limits to foreigners, and no one knows how many ethnic Nepalese still live there. But we managed to persuade one Lutsampa to cross the border into India to speak to us. If you glance at it on the surface, it all looks good. But there's a very corrupt plot going on at the deeper level. Bhutan says there are only 100,000 Nepalis here. But there are more than 150 to 200,000 Nepalis who are not even counted in the census. They are non-existent, almost. But people are not being killed or disappeared anymore. Before, we couldn't even find their dead bodies. They were just arrested and taken away. After the Lhotsampas left, the government immediately gave the best land and property to the Drukpas. But they haven't given the land out in the areas that are open to international visitors. It seems like they are trying to hide something from international eyes. I've seen too many people suffer and I can't endure it. I want to share it with someone, to pour it out. Despite these stories, Back in Nepal, a few thousand refugees are so attached to the land of their birth, they have not taken up the chance to move abroad. In this area, there are a few families that are leaving, but most of the families don't want to leave. They are still waiting for repatriation. Whenever there is any news from Bhutan, they rush to listen to it. Sancho Hang Suba was just six when he arrived in Nepal. Now 30, he has few memories of Bhutan, but he does have very strong feelings for his country. Bhutan is my birthplace, and I will never find that anywhere else. That's the final truth, my biggest reality. I feel sad about that, so I still haven't thought of marries, though I'm 30. Because I would not want my children to be born without identity, stateless, and to have to suffer like a child of the street. I'd rather it ends with me. And I have accepted this pain, and I have decided not to marry. We have had enough hardship for these 23 years and only the Bhutanese government can rid us of this hardship. Only they have the medicine to heal our wound. No one else has it. I request the Bhutanese government to take us in once again and accept us as their own. The refugees who are still keen to go back to Bhutan are now faced with a dilemma. They've been told that they only have three more months before the option of resettlement closes. With Bhutan still not extending its hand to take back its citizens, the future remains uncertain for the remaining refugees. In the ideal world, we'd have all those options available and, and available at any, any one time, but uh, we don't live in that ideal world and the only option that we did have available uh, was uh, was the, the resettlement. Uh, we have had a number of, uh, made a number of demarches with uh, Bhutan over the years. Uh, unfortunately, these have not produced any results. Despite the uncertainty, there are some who just want to stay in Nepal. But Nepal's government has not signed any refugee conventions and remains unwilling to assimilate the refugees. Nepal is not the position to, to integrate them here in Nepal. It is because of three things. Number one, we are not a party of that convention and protocol. Number two, uh, our economy does not permit 
our geography does not permit. So we are not uh, to integrate them here in Nepal. But uh, most of them have resettled and the residual citizens, our refugees of Bhutan, should go back to their own country. So Bhutan should be flexible enough to repatriate its own citizen. This is our clear stand. After languishing in the camps and with their dreams of returning home fading, most have already left to start new lives in a new country. The rubble of their demolished homes, the only thing that remains of their lives in Nepal. For Sabitra, the decision to leave was a rational one. She sees a better future for her children in America and has a sister who relocated there last year. Worry is natural. We're not rocks or stones. Why I'm slightly worried about leaving. But this time, I'm leaving by my own accord. Nobody is forcing me to go. Before they can leave, Sabitra and her family must pass their final health checks. Their biggest concern is for Sabitra's daughter, Radhika. Radhika contracted TB as a child and has been taking medication for the past three years. The infection has to be completely clear before they'll get the health certificates they'll need to leave. It's good news. Radhika is clear. The International Office of Migration, or IOM, is responsible for ensuring refugees like Sabitra are prepared for the resettlement. At a center near the camp, they're being taught about their rights and responsibilities as refugees in the United States. The family is making their final preparations. There is no special allowance. They're only allowed 20 kilograms of luggage each and are forced to leave a lifetime of possessions behind. At last, it's time to leave the camps. To mark the start of their long journey, the family is given blessings and good wishes by friends and neighbors. As they walk through the camp, they hand out small gifts of money. It's an emotional goodbye. I don't tear up easily. I didn't even cry when lighting my mother's funeral pyre. I loved her very much. But I don't cry easily. In the UN, there's often talk about burden sharing and so forth, and this is this has gone well beyond uh, lip service on on burden sharing, on international burden sharing. The resettlement countries 
have taken close to 90,000 refugees from Nepal. This is a remarkable story. The first leg of these migrants' journey will take them to Nepal's capital, Kathmandu. And to get there, they'll have to take their first ever flight. On arrival, the family are moved to the IOM center where they'll spend the next three days. There are going to be many firsts for these refugees. The rules and regulations of international air travel are completely new to them and they have much to learn. Would you like to have something to eat? Banana, Fruit? Okay. Uh, here is your uh, fruit, ma'am. Sir, would you like to have something to eat? Or drink? Fruit, I don't I do not speak your language, sir. Would you please help ask him uh, what he would like to have? He said tea. Tea, right? Okay, I'll be right back. Finally, the day is here. After 23 years, Sabitra and her family are leaving to start their new lives. I'll miss my parents the most. I was born to them in some corner of Bhutan. They gave me life and brought me into this world. I had to perform their last rites in this land. I wonder if their spirits will be with us in the United States. But that's how life is. And I'll have my children there with me. Life goes on like this, in steps. Maybe my children will have to leave me there. They'll probably feel the same way I'm feeling now. They'll feel bad that I was born somewhere lived somewhere and died somewhere else. Next week, in the second of two special 101 East programs, we'll continue the journey with Sabitra and her family as they set up home in the United States. And we'll meet many other Bhutanese refugees who have already made the move and find that while this promises a fresh start, it's no guarantee of success, with many battling depression and some even taking their own lives. Mm -hmm.